Okay, so this is the panelist group. We're here to talk about a project um, that has lots of different facets. Actually, I'm gonna send out some links now and then close my, my Zoom on my phone because I hear myself. Okay, and leaving. Um, so this is a project that started kind of with a couple different spokes. One of the spokes and the major backbone of this project is um, uh, New Art City, which Don to my left here uh, is the author of. He, he wrote New Art City. It's a 3D enabled web-based platform. Um, it was written in the spring of 2020 in response to the global pandemic. At the time, Don was my MFA student at San Jose State University and created an exhibition space essentially for our students who lost all of their in-person exhibition capabilities. Um, we're going to talk a little, he'll talk a little bit more about the, the platform itself, um, but it's written in such a way uh, that it's using uh, an open source 3D library, uh, a WebGL library, 3JS, um, HTML, CSS, and that is basically it. Um, at the same time, um, the, this project is funded by the Knight Foundation, and we're in phase one. Uh, but phase two and phase three start looking towards VR, X, XR capabilities. So the code was written in such a way that it can be uh, VR, VR enabled in the future. Um, right now, we're going to be working through a beta test uh, that provides an archive of new media works produced in the South Bay from in San Jose and California from 1984 to 2014. Um, phase two and phase three start looking at uh, a digital stewardship center housed within San Jose State University. And inside the center, we'll do things like we're going to beta test uh, re-offering a 3D project from Tomiko Thiel, uh, written in VRML programming language, re-offering it for uh, the web, basically. Operating under the assumption that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are probably the most archival web languages or digital languages out there. A lot about the internet would have to change for the libraries to not work in 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, so we can talk a little bit later maybe about what, <laughs> what we mean when we say archival digital languages. You know, is that 50 years? Is it 10 years? Um, one of the things that came up for me when I was conceiving of this project, I'll kind of back up a little bit and then maybe uh, dig back down. Um, I was talking with Tamiko Thiel who had, her and her husband wrote an augmented reality app um, to, for her projects. And, you know, the Whitney would collect her project, but every time iOS updated their operating, you know, anytime Android or Apple updated their operating systems, the app would break. So one of the things that we were thinking about was that students at San Jose State University in the Cadre Media Lab could update her app to keep it viable so that like the Whitney could continue to show the work. Um, we were in discussions about that when Dawn created New Art City. And I was also in discussions with our library about ways that we can share research that utilizes the VR technologies. It's really, as everyone here probably knows, it's really hard, one, uh, to, to create an app that is durable, that will continue to work with the next um, OS updates. Um, and it's also really hard to, sh to share the app. Uh, so what is the platform that, you know, that where we can share this app? 
um, Apple in the past, you know, artists who have put apps up on, you know, Apple store, they've had them deleted if they're not downloaded, you know, within X amount of time. So that's not really an archival method. method. So the library had a massive interest in, in creating a system that could share VR art projects, um, but also create uh, a way to cite VR as, as research. So all of these things were kind of in the mix when Don created New Art City. And I was like, I think New Art City is a great exhibition platform, but I think it might be the solve for all of these other issues. So um, phase one, we're working on archiving um, both artistic art, like artistic uh, practices uh, in the South Bay, but also we initiated uh, archiving switch journal, which is a, an online journal published from 1994 to 2014. Um, and Nick will talk a little bit about that project that we've been, Nick and the, who works for the San Jose State University Library. And then I also threw in some of the projects here. Uh, you can see behind me the ISEA 2006 symposium. There was a lot of, of work. I don't know if anybody attended that one. Um, There's a lot of new media work that was produced in the South Bay at that time. So a lot of the archive will probably have a special feature for that. Um, the, the beta test that we're working on right now is um, a joint project produced uh, in collaboration with the Japanese American History Museum. So I put in the, for folks on the Zoom, I put some links in there. If you all want to go back and like link to this presentation, I can share that out. Um, so you can check it out. But New York City typically has been exhibiting new, new media works that artists create themselves. So it's been really hard to kind of talk about this also as an archiving platform. Um, so I'm going to play the video and kind of talk over it. I have some notes here. So hopefully this plays. Uh, so when you land on the site, this is basically what you see and then you, you, you pop into a 3D world. Why are we here? Why are we here? Um, the sound that you hear is actually in the exhibition itself. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the ways that sound plays an important role. And can play an important role for VR and accessibility. So students enrolled in three classes from the Department of Art and Art History work with stakeholders from the Japanese American History Museum to help produce visual art. My life. I, in fact, I've lived in Japantown all my life. And this is Dr. Tokyo Ishikawa. I was born on Jackson Street in 1909. Okay. And I've lived in San Jose all my so life. So the, the, the sound assets are actually spatially um, located. Um, assets were sourced from the, the Japanese American History Museum, personal archives, and several digital archives hosted within the Martin Luther King Library. So these would be like traditional digital archive platforms, Island Door, et cetera. Um, while there are a number of issues that could be brought out using this uh, Cal County home and families experience, this project focused on those with relevance to, for our society and the challenge it faced to expand and deepen civil liberties, education for the students and the public. Uh, the, the beta tests allowed the team to compare curation, navigation, just and discoverability of digital objects in, the, in exhibiting uh, digital archive uh, platforms with a web-based 3D environment in New York City. Unlike traditional digital archives, New York City platform integrates collection management and exhibition. Use, like, utilizing spatial proximity, temporal texture, and architectural aggregation rather than overlapping windows or the long scroll to help researchers, exhibition designers, and public visitors make deeper connections to and between digital entries. Just as an aside, when I was working with the students on this um, exhibition, one of the students was asking where a PDF was located. <laughs> and instead of you know, directing somebody through a series of folders, um, the other student said, oh, it's upstairs on, on the table. And so thinking about ways that we can kind of spatialize information and make connections um, through a 3D environment and the ways that that might be different than a traditional 2D um, research environment. Um, so the users can also log, uh, create a, a log. There's a chat and like an exhibition log that's currently in use. 
The other thing that that can do is allow specific 3D assets to kind of migrate through different exhibition um, rooms or spaces. Um, and we can attach kind of a folksonomy. So, you know, uh, every time something is exhibited in a, in, a, in a platform, the curators or the visitors can kind of log information that stays a, attached to the object as it moves through different exhibitions. Um, we're also integrating blockchain technology. So in, similarly, um, any, any digital certificates that kind of get attached to objects can migrate with them as, as they move through exhibitions. And we're also gonna be focusing on artist contracts. So when you upload a particular asset into the exhibition, artists can stipulate how this can be used um, and how it could, might need to be reauthored in the future. So like what would be the bare minimum requirements for this work to stay the work? Um, once it's uploaded to the server, all of the assets are, can be bundled and downloaded as a zip file. So that uh, in the case of a project that we'll probably talk, Amanda might talk about in a minute, um, Tomiko, the, the artist did not want this to be exhibited on the web. It, it, the idea is that it would always be in an installation environment. So once, you use New Art City to build, um, and maybe Don can talk a little bit about how New Art City for the back end, what that does. But once you, you essentially build this environment, you can download it, get the HTML, CSS, and any associated libraries, potentially even an archive browser with it so that it's a bundled package and it can be shown, used locally, um, so that's not even you know, integrated into the web. Um, I think, um, yeah, so one of the things that's come up several times uh, in this conference is the way that archiving is both kind of look, always necessarily looking back um, into the past. One of the, the presenters earlier today talked about connecting the dots how, and used the Steve Jobs quote that that's always kind of, you know, backward looking. But what we, what we save and what we preserve is also going to shape our future. Um, and it is a political act. The act of preservation is a political act. And we kind of understand that to be the case. So one of the things that we want to focus on is both what gets archived, um, but also how do how what what is what are the tools for accessibility and what does that look like for researchers and for artists? So I'm with that said, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Don. <laughs> okay. Do you want to yeah sure hello um my name is Don Hansen. I am an internet artist and a designer. And New York City is my main project. Um, and you just heard a lot about it, but essentially the, the idea was to create a virtual exhibition space. That was the first priority. Make a space online where artists can upload whatever they want, um, any digital file, and arrange that in 3D space in a multiplayer environment that is easy to share. Um, I'm a big believer in the web as a platform for, for preserving and sharing work, specifically because you can create work, launch it, and share it so quickly. Um, you don't have to have a physical gallery in order to, to publish an exhibition on your own website, for instance. Um, but that kind of ability is only available to like web developers or people who have skills in like building websites. So the idea with New York City is make a place online where there's very low barriers to creating a virtual exhibition. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was about two years ago that we started this project and it was a small team. And since then there's, um, there's I think 30, between 30,000 and 40,000 artworks that have been uploaded into New York City. And it, it creates an interesting question because what is the difference between an exhibition space and the archive of the work itself? What is the difference between archiving and preserving work versus just indexing work and pointing back to like an, a representative artifact where New York City is both the exhibition space and it is the archive of the actual work that has been uploaded. Um, yeah, and we've, we've been working with some institutions like San Jose State University, which is kind of where, where this project initially was created. And in the process of working with institutions, um, 
we had to make sure that the project is accessible to all, all people, all people uh, of different ability levels. And luckily with the web, there's some really great resources and ways of making digital work and websites accessible. Um, so that was a big priority for us. Um, so with every 3D virtual exhibition space that is published, it automatically generates a catalog view, which is all of the same metadata, because when you upload an artwork, you're gonna need to say, who's the artist? What is the title? A description about it, like all the regular metadata that you would have in an archive. And in the process of building your 3D space, it automatically generates that 2D list of works, which is what we call the catalog view. Um, so like, that. So you can see this is um, Unbound, Unleashed, and Unforgiving. So the catalog view here on the right, and then the 3D view um, on the left. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the, why that's in, important, both in terms of, you know, providing the data, the metadata, and, you know, a representation of the object together, but also how that works with the accessibility feature? Yeah. And future and like some of your future goals. So. Yeah, so when, when we archive one of these um, virtual spaces, like Rhonda was, was talking about, like because it's web technology, it becomes very portable and we can kind of zip up everything that is in the, in the space, including the catalog view into a portable zip file. And that becomes the um, kind of the artifact of the exhibition that can be held long-term. And we've had a few um, projects already where like pieces need to be shown in a museum where they're not gonna have internet connectivity, for instance. And those kind of offline versions can be like put into kiosk mode. Um, yeah, yeah. and did you, I'm sorry, you might have mentioned, so the, the 2D view also becomes a way for screen readers to navigate these exhibitions. And some of the, some of the future, um, hopefully with this grant or maybe phase two or phase three, um, we can start beta testing accessibility features for VR. And so that might look something like a guided tour where it's, it's the, instead of just kind of a list view, top to down scrolling environment, it's spatialized, right? So to your left, you see, you know, and so part part of the, the navigation uh, of, of a spatialized world that doesn't prioritize visibility, but also, but does prioritize like spatial experience. So I think that that's a really interesting, um, interesting feature. And Santa, one of the reasons San Jose State kind of incorporated New York City, um, we have, really strict accessibility rules for platforms that we use. And uh, New York City was willing to work with us to, uh, to go through what's called a VPAT uh, certification process. So that's basically an analysis of accessibility. And no other um, like virtual exhibition platform that we were looking at to solve a lot of the, the pandemic problems, but also just kind of, you know, a platform to, to use in, in perpetuity. None of the other platforms are willing to work with us on that. Um, okay, I think that, so yeah, this is kind of a slide representing that like code that you basically download. You download the code, you, you also download, re-download in, in that package, all of the original assets and an indexed, a database index. So the database and the metadata, um, that becomes really important when we start thinking about like archivalness. So is it is what we're archiving the 3D experience? I think that that will go a long way. Um, I think, you know, as it stands, we can continue to experience the 3D environment as it stands, you know, probably for 15, 20 years. But then after that, the, the assets themselves, the XYZ location of them, and then all of the, the metadata in an XML file becomes really important for archiving. And that's kind of where we segue into um, maybe Nick, who I, I can't see any of the presenters here. So hi, Nick and Amanda and Timothy. Nick, are you on and do you want I'm to- I'm here, yeah. Hi, Rhonda, hi, Don. Hi, Nick, it's so good to hear your voice. Thanks yeah. for waking up so early. So, so Nick and Amanda are in um, California, and I think Tim, 
uh, Dr. Timothy uh, Summers is in Arizona. So Nick, do you want to kind of walk us through some of the, the, the work that we've been doing with the beta test for the, the Switch Journal? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so I'm Nick Sadlowski. I'm the Scholarly Communications and Digital Scholarship Librarian at San Jose State University. And um, I've really been enjoying this symposium. I got to come to some of the presentations uh, yesterday morning. Um, can you hear me okay? Is that? Yeah, you sound great. Oh, okay, great. Um, one of the most exciting parts of this project, and I think of this, this discipline in general, is that it brings together participants from a really wide variety of disciplines. So I'm gonna share an aspect of this, pro this project that involves the Martin Luther King Jr. Library at SGSU, and that is the archiving of SWITCH. I think we can go to the next slide here. Um, so SWITCH is a journal published by the Cadre Lab Laboratory for New Media at SGSU which has been published exclusively online since 1995. We in the library are used to working with journals and helping students and faculty publish journals, but working with an electronic only journal that is that early has really been an interesting project. Um, I wanna emphasize how early 1995 is for an electronic journal, especially one with, visual, with a visual element. Um, I've been researching this a little on the side and according to the Association of Research Libraries, in 1995, there were only 675 electronic journals and newsletters of any kind in the world. And you could buy a print directory from ARL to help you find those journals. And fewer than half of those publications were distributed on the World Wide Web, like Switch was. Most of them were published via email or Gopher. Um, so this is really very early times for electronic journals, um, and it impacts the archiving process. Um, I think we're ready for the next slide. Um, so we in the library have been working with Rhonda and other faculty in Cadre, as well as their students to archive this journal. Um, this has some important benefits. The archive version is easy to find and cite. It's indexed in Google Scholar and it has much improved accessibility compared to the original. We're hosting the journal on SJSU ScholarWorks, which is SJSU's institutional repository. That also means the library is able to take the long-term responsibility for preserving this content. So this kind of, we've, we're making it fit with other content that we're already, we already know how to preserve and we're already confident in our ability to work with. Um, I wanna briefly describe the process we're using to create that archive. There's a link on the slides to the GitHub site for the project. And we're hoping to publish an article in the journal Code for Lib sometime soon with more detail in the process, but this is a brief outline. Um, first, we used open source software called HTT Track to create a local archive of the journal site. Then we used some Python scripts to address problems in the original journal and prepare the HTML files for conversion to PDF. Those scripts fix text encoding and accessibility issues and extract basic metadata from each article. We're then working with students in the cadre program to augment the metadata, write abstracts, add alt text images, and research the authors and artists featured in the journal. Uh, to me, this is one of the most exciting parts of the project to involve students with the archiving process in a way that lets them engage with the discipline and also gain information literacy skills in a hands-on way. Um, and their work has really been amazing and it's made the archive journal much richer and more discoverable for the intended audience. Um, so that's our project so far, and we in the library are very excited to contribute to the other parts of this project as the digital archive evolves. And I want to add, I think that there may be a lot of potential to bring academic libraries into the kind of archiving work that's being discussed at the symposium. Um, I found in academic environments, there are a lot of other communities of practice whose work presents similar preservation challenges and digital archiving challenges. I'm thinking especially of digital humanities work. And a lot of academic libraries are already actively working with digital humanists, but I think fewer have gotten involved with new media art. So I hope we can kind of in our project model that kind of collaboration and show that's feasible, especially even in a smaller library, which we are in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, this has been a great project and I'm excited to hear from everybody else. Um, and uh, like through the, the project that uh, the, the archiving of Switch Journal, um, it's gone through a couple iterations. Like, there were was like issues one through 14, 1994 to I think 2001 or two um, that were pretty 
like they were hand coded every single issue. So not only is do we have a snapshot of, you know, articles, you know, in 1996 writing about gender and electronic, you know, space and you know identity and presentation, um, AI in like 1997, an um, issue dedicated to AI. Um, and virtual worlds, I think, in 1996 as well. Um, so really interesting to get snapshots from ways that artists and researchers are thinking about it, but it's also this interesting snapshot of the history of web development and design. <laughs> and so the, some of the challenges that we've run into um, are, are, yeah, it's just, it, it, if anybody's tried to do you know, web archiving, even on a single site, that can be challenging. But if the the, the database and the kind of methodology uh, is unique for each issue, that presents another host of <laughs> interesting challenges. And then things like a game issue, which was literally a downloadable execution executable. So the entire issue is that we we no longer have access to. So how do we think about that? And how what are the ways that New Art City like? Can we reauthor these works to create? Uh, like a, an environmental um, experience of these. Um, and so some of the issues that, that Nick brings up in terms of you know, archiving for, for libraries, searchability and discoverability also dovetail with museum um, preservation, but slightly different, right? So each one of the guests today and, and all of the collaborators bring in a slightly different perspective. So Amanda, do you wanna uh, talk a little bit about the San Jose Museum of Art and our, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Amanda Hilton. I work at the San Jose Museum of Art as the manager of digital strategy. Um, so I'm really bringing the perspective of the museum's collections management and digital engagement, um, sort of in equal parts. <laughs> um, I would say starting around the 50s and 60s, museums really started uh, collecting digital art and it's flourished since then in contemporary art collections uh, as artists have continued to experiment with new and emerging technology. And that has necessarily placed a significant burden on museums that collect digital art because technology moves a lot faster than we do. <laughs> and as it ages and fails, we sort of have to pivot and figure out um, how, how do we continue to uphold collections preservation and stewardship uh, missions in the face of, of you know, shifting technology. Um, so the reliance on technology of those artworks um, that is inherent in those artworks creates new complexity um, for, and so museum uh, professionals aren't necessarily ready yet <laughs> for these changes, but um, the reality is that in-house digital preservation skills and expertise are pretty much not a given at most institutions. Um, and you're really lucky to have at least one sort of tech savvy person <laughs> Um, sometimes. So that's something that's still really building at a lot of different institutions. Um, and it requires, you know, a competency across a lot of different mediums and sort of, you know, physical media and digitizing things. And it's a, it's a skill set that um, is still really nascent. Um, so typically, this is unfamiliar territory for a lot of museums, not just in terms of actual preservation activities, but even just in evaluating their collections to set digital preservation uh, goals or plan and policy. Um, uh, our museum has collected a lot of, of new media work and we're at the beginning of that process of figuring out, you know, looking at our new media collection and saying, okay, when we collected this, did, you know, what was the situation and what is the situation now, um, which is, uh, the Tomiko Thiel work, artwork is a good example of, of hopefully what will become a sort of uh, helpful case study uh, for us in uh, hopefully be instructive in that policymaking around preservation of digital art and helping us figure out how to be prepared for these changes and how to steward our collection. So a really cross uh, functional project like this is really exciting and honestly, like just what the doctor ordered, because I think um, that this is a really a monumental task for a lot of museums. And it's really something that has to be considered um, collectively and sort of sharing information 
um, and thinking through these issues early on um, is really helpful for the museum to have like access to people with different expertise so that we can like bring those perspectives in and help that inform um, our processes around taking care of the art that we're responsible for, but also making sure that we can continue to share that art with the largest possible uh, group of people. You know, and I think one of the, the thoughts behind the Digital Stewardship Center at San Jose State University is leveraging some of the, the public mandate, but also the kind of deep history. It was the first public university in California, which um, here, the timeline in, in Europe, the timeline is different, I know, but, but that that's, means something um, in the US and specifically in California. So we have the mandate to serve the public, but we also can become a public uh, like a service facing institution. So we can work with San Jose State University, we can work with uh, Leonardo um, uh, to help with some of these wicked problems because it does take so many different types of expertise. And as a university, we have folks in these fields. A couple of our partners who are not with us today, um, Dara Hoffman from the iSchool, the Library of Sciences at uh, San Jose State University, who specializes in uh, blockchain technology and trustworthiness of data. She's worked on a project that put the Brazilian uh, rainforest uh, owned by indigenous tribes on the blockchain so that the government and other <laughs> uh, interested parties, uh, it was non-corruptible data. Um, so that, that's really interesting to me to think about. And there have been a couple presentations about different strategies for managing uh, blockchain. I don't think for 30,000, how many artworks do are uploaded? It's between 30 and 49. I don't think <laughs> I don't think blockchain makes sense for 30 or 40,000, but in cases where somebody has minted a certificate, I think being able to kind of point back to that in a meaningful way, um, through, through this database is really important. Um, and Timothy Sumners, who is here as a representative of Leonardo, who's one of our kind of archival uh, partners for the exhibition of phase one, uh, but also works at Arizona State University with um, blockchain technologies. And maybe, I'm not, I'm gonna butcher it. Timothy, do you wanna do a better job? <laughs> No, no, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, really, really excited to be here and with this really esteemed forward thinking and innovative panel. Um, I'm Timothy Summers. I'm a board member for Leonardo and the executive director of Third Horizon Initiatives at Arizona State University. My job is to identify the most emergent and innovative tech uh, and uh, out of the future and sort of think about ways to make it applicable today. Um, I was really glad to hear you mention uh, one of our colleagues at the iSchool. Uh, I, I actually was previously at an iSchool before I came to Arizona State, and uh, that was really uh, an important experience for me and one of the reasons I'm just so excited about this work. But specifically with Leonardo, um, I advise on many areas of disruptive innovation, um, including extended reality, cybersecurity, which can include areas like privacy by design, security by design. Uh, trying to ensure seamless uh, yet responsible environments and also distributed ledger technologies like blockchain and other areas of what we now refer to as web3 um, this interinstitutional effort uh, just really has been exciting uh, to to watch the development and growth uh, lots of, of you know uh, kudos has to go to, to don and team for the work on uh, new art city because it is quite amazing the capabilities there uh, the convergence of these technologies, though, is, is really uh, incredibly inspiring and encouraging for me uh, because of we are existing in this uh, a bit of a coordination revolution. Um, I like to think of it as a digital trust revolution in a way. Uh, we're establishing what trust and ownership mean in this digital world, and, and we're really forming it together. And blockchains have been a really important part of this, right? Uh, powering novel forms of coordination. We're seeing that across money, finance, the internet, um, and, and really we've seen some of the most profound applications uh, of blockchain through self-sovereign identity and self-sovereign digital money and, and decentralized finance and, and other spaces there. Um, and, and we talked about this idea of uh, the use of blockchain certificates and, and the ability to lend um, and, and how to appropriately archive and capture uh, you know, the, these digital assets that are being created 
uh, by creatives all over. How do we, you know, how do we appropriately have a backbone that enables a decentralized, open, and permissionless sort of an environment that we might want to have in those kinds of uh, of ecosystems? And you know, the, it really is a unique time uh, for all of us. I, I I think it's important to kind of mention that there's a sort of three different major things happening uh, right before our eyes, the money revolution being sort of one, but where we're seeing Bitcoin kind of this global decentralized non-state money idea and many others like that. Uh, the financial revolution where we're seeing decentralized finance enabling global collections of individuals to just come together without it even having met each other before and coordinating financial support and services for, for you know, things that, uh, missions that maybe they feel connected to. Um, and then also this internet revolution, specifically around uh, interoperability and what a user owned web means. Uh, that is really, this is the first time we're really in a place where we're starting to be able to pull apart what trust and, and ownership mean in these kinds of environments. And, you know, we really believe that Web3 virtual environments, like the ones we're talking about here today, will thrive, uh, you know, especially if online human participants can own and be a part of and participants of and part of the community. In the traditional Web2 spaces that we've kind of lived in, I mean, for the most part, users face, you know, all kinds of restrictions on the products and services that they, they interact with. Uh, you, as a gamer, I'll point out one of the sort of gaming pieces, but you can't port uh, in-game assets uh, from one place to another. Or how about, you know, if you want to port uh, an, a digital asset from one environment to another environment, whether it be a different university or a different artistic environment or creative environment, there really hasn't been a way to do that uh, up until now. And, and, and there has been many uh, discussion and debate topics around you know the risk of censorship around social media platforms and 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 how individuals are able to profit from their content so in con in contrast right with with blockchain environments we're really talking about enabling you know users to be able to store and trade their assets to own those assets and then to maybe even be able to to lend those assets to others or trade them for other digital assets that they may find of value this enablement of owning digital assets is huge. It provides a way for us to establish trust for digital objects, a sense of provenance. The, this, uh, this Web3 concept uh, is considered to be the future of the internet, but really, I mean, it's a vision of a blockchain-based web uh, that includes all kinds of things like tokens, uh, non-fungible tokens, for example. And I'm probably gonna date myself a little bit here because NFTs is actually, you know, for me, and when we first started talking about this stuff, we were still calling it by its name of ERC721, but now everyone knows it as NFTs. Um, but there's other topics in there like decentralized autonomous organizations and, and other pieces of decentralized finance that we're just finding are incredibly empowering for not only individuals and creatives, but really for anyone uh, interested in, 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 in being a contributor. Um, and, and for clarity, you know, NFTs serve as a smart contracts that verify ownership of digital assets on the blockchain. Uh, they really usurp the sort of uh, uh, expectation that we need centralized platforms to house everything, to control and verify everything. Uh, you all are familiar with, uh, I'm sure, the amount that uh, art has changed the NFT space. Uh, in fact, uh, more than 75% of all NFTs uh, on the Ethereum network are all art related, which speaks a lot uh, to where we are right now, just in the conversation around technology and art and how it all is coming together. We expect digital assets and digital wallets to be a huge part of our lives as well. Digital wallets allow anyone with a connected device to transact uh, not only money, but digital assets. And, you know, I hope that you're just as excited as we are about this work. I'm incredibly encouraged by powerful toolkits like New York City and the empowerment of artists to create their most ideal spaces and experiences. Technology is a tool, but more importantly uh, than the tool itself is knowing when to use the right tool for the right job. And I just wanna say thanks for the opportunity to share just some of these thoughts and insights on digital trust, security, archiving, and Web3.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Timothy. We're kind of nearing the end here. So I, I don't know that we have time for, for Q&A, but maybe I can wrap up by just saying, you know, one of the interesting things about this project is having so many different stakeholders kind of in at the, its inception. So some of the things that Timothy's talking about, you know, being able to move assets freely, is that it, in contrast with some of the museum's um, mandates right for for kind of control and and stewardship and i don't think so and i think um, one of the things that keeps coming up is the idea of of stewardship rather than ownership as as the model um here and all of our overlapping interests and in kind of maintaining that so um i might end it there for us to kind of think about um and, and to meditate on um as we kind of move through and create with New Art City systems for discoverability, indexability, and then um, artist contracts upon upload that are, aren't massive legalese, but it's like, do you want this object to be freely you know, curatable? Do you want this object to, if so, does it have a time, an expiration date, or do, does it need to be a permission? Um, and what's the contact information for that kind of permission? So anyway, lots of things to think about. Thank you, um, everyone on Zoom. Thank you, Don. Uh, and Thank you, we'll, we'll end it here. Thank you. 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 I'm, I'm glad the room is full again. Um, what did you say, Bonnie? Oh, the thing is coming in, so that the more people continue. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> no questions? <laughs> Unless I was being completely clear, but um, yeah, you're, you're we're pressed. completely okay. <laughs> no, I wonder whether anybody had been at ICA in 2006 in San Jose, I think. Yeah. For that. Of course, we have been there. Yeah. Well, we have been there, and, and then has anybody else in the room been there? Because, yeah, sure, sure. And yeah. um, so we've all been there, and uh, I remember the great works in the museum, uh, Amanda, in, in uh, the Museum of uh, Art in uh, San Jose. And of course, I remember the rest. I remember the ethical issue with the pigeons. Yes. They have pigeons with little cameras or something, and uh, they were like geo tracking. They wore these little uh, geolocators, and as they flew, they tracked their movement. Yeah, and and then the animal friends protested because the pigeons didn't want drivers. That was <laughs> about story. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and Kader also played an important role in that uh, symposium, and uh, to Timothy. Who has disappeared from this screen, but he is still the Zoom screen, I'm sure. Uh, Timothy is uh, uh, very welcome to participate in the roundtable we uh, have on ethical issues later on, as you are all, of course. Um, we have a very short break. Bobby keeps trying to uh, talk to me in, uh, in sign language. We have a quick question. Seeing, uh, seeing your um, uh, Manet Young collection, uh, uh, Long Beach with artist from Riga, Latvia, um, and this is one of the, one of the presentations with um, with a bit of respect to the job you've done. Still, uh, somehow, I find it um, kind of mixture of um, um, euphoria and and um, some kind of. Um, not in-depth analysis of the effects of NFT and the, the digital structures, which how you would do, gonna um, counter the uh, tendencies that, for example, with NFT um, structure, there's you create a, a small uh, minority of few, let's say, kind of art stars who um, ride the wave of the initial pop pop popularity and the big, big majority who is actually paying for that and, and, and ends up lose, uh, losing the, the financial uh, incentives to, to continue that in the longer run, I think. And this, this has to be addressed because I think a lot of these promises, they won't, won't be uh, true uh, in a few years. There's, you know, this, th there's so much to talk about with NFTs. I find it a fascinating topic. It, Kind of forces the subject on you know um, ethical um, 
and environmental impact of computation in general, right? So I'm running a, a, a small symposium at San Jose State University um, around this. So we'll actually mint so that we understand the, the process, but we're using a lazy minting, which, which doesn't actually produce the certificate, doesn't do the heavy computing until purchase. Um, and I wanna bring in, a, there will be a couple other artists and curators who work it, experimentally with this. Kalani Nicole, I think might've presented yesterday, um, Transfer Gallery, um, and Tina Rivers Ryan, who's written a couple really good articles about NFTs will be a part of that. Uh, Wade Wallerston, who is a curator for the um, Canadian consulate uh, in the United States, but also runs Silicon Valley uh, platform. So it, I think you, yeah, there's no way we could, you know, in 40 minutes. So I kind no, of I, skirted I, around the NFT question. Good question, Bill. Yeah. Um, with NFT, there, there'll be a separate summit next year. <laughs> exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Amanda, you. Nick, Timothy, uh, Doug, and yeah. uh, Rhonda. Uh, we have a short break till 4.25. Be back then, please. Thank you. If everybody can please come to the meeting. Then we'll start again. I was told to stand here and not there. <laughs> so I'll do that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Maria Crescentino. Is she anywhere to be found? Because it's an in person. Uh, oh, Maria. And she will give a, a long paper talk about uh, video archiving. I'll uh, push these other people in. Okay. Thank you very much for the for having me here. Um, Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, well, um, I am Alejandra Crescentino. I am a student, in, um, I am a researcher at the Universidad de Madrid, and I was studying history of art in Argentina, so uh, that's my situation point of view. Uh, and I was listening to when uh, while writing this presentation, that's why I thought staying and I was a good title for the presentation. Uh, um, the purpose of um, my, um, my presentation is to reflect on some challenges affecting physical and digital archives dedicated to the art in the southern corner. Uh, to start this discussion, I will refer to some relevant Latin American video art festivals that foster the production, circulation, and dissemination of audiovisual arts in the last two decades of the 20th century, and additionally foster the creation of physical archives in the region. Secondly, I will explain some institutional and academic projects uh, that uh, since the mid of uh, 2000s have carried out tasks of valorization and validation of video-based art collections. Since it is impossible to carry out an exhaustive study of all the institutions and archives dedicated to video art, I will focus on four academic institutional projects linked to five binary video art festivals. Regarding methodological project and um, how do I change? Sorry, how do I change the, the slide? Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, we uh, I was connected telepathically with the previous presentation. We have the same te template. Um, well, I was talking about my methodology. I was visiting uh, in person. Uh, centers, archives in Chile, Argentina, and Spain. And in relation to the theoretical framework, um, I ascribe to the notion of remediation proposed by Boulter and Rossing, which alludes to the power of digital media to remediate all media through a process of repassioning. This argument allows us to conceive of today institutional databases as repassion extensions of physical archives and video-based art libraries. libraries. Referring to technological archives, Argentine researcher Jorge Laferla identified several difficulties 
linked to the absence of comprehensive collections to trace the memory of the audiovisual arts in Latin America. In his reflections, he pointed out the fundamental role played by the traveling video and experimental film exhibitions in the creation of archives uh, and the theoretical reconstruction and the material recovery of pieces that were thought to be lost. He stressed that in the absence of consistent public policies for heritage protections, uh, some institutions and agents have taken on the task of preserving and updating technological works that would otherwise remain inaccessible. These observations constitute a starting point to offer a rereading of the video art archives in the present. In order to understand the current state of the institutional physical archives, holding videographic works in analog media, it is necessary to look back at events that took place in the past. The use of video art as, I'm sorry, the use of video as support and means of artistic creation dates back the, to the early 70s, linked to a few institutions, as you can see on the screen. Among them, the Centro de Artes y Comunicación in Buenos Aires and the Museo de Arte Contemporánea at the Universidad de Sao Paulo, with paradigmatic trajectories in this regard. However, beyond these specific examples, video did not achieve significant, a significant presence until the 80s, when some institutions in the Southern Corn held festivals and generated collections dedicated to the art, coinciding with the global expansion of mass media and new technologies. As Laferla pointed out, the proliferation of exhibitions and events around video, um, around video during this period was a major factor, factor in the creation of audiovisual archives. Likewise, video libraries became highly appreciated as they offer the possibility to consult audiovisual materials in different magnetic or optical formats. An example uh, of such convergence is the Encuentro Latinoamericano de Video, promoted by independent producers from all over Latin America. Among the hundreds of associations and collectives at the forefront of these meetings was the Centro de Medios Audiovisuales, an Uruguayan production company that stood out for its extensive audiovisual work. For this reason, it became the subject of an academic research project which that will be referred later in this uh, paper. Uh, video art also grew as an autonom autonomous artistic discipline supported by international circuit, specialized circuit, uh, thanks to the support of foreign financing uh, agencies, especially those of the French and Spanish cooperation. Several festival exhibitions and hours were created. For instance, the Festival Franco Chileno de Video Arte and the Festival Franco Latinoamericano de Video Arte were consolidated thanks to the support provided by the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and by numerous local institutions. For its first 10 years, Santiago de Chile was a capital, but since the 1990s, it has expanded to become a multi site event that is spread to Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and Colombia. As a result, each participating institution formed a partial collection of the festival, safeguarding videographic pieces, vestiges, and documentation sources. Sao Paulo hosted the Video Brazil Festival, organized by, at first by the Museo da Imagine do Som. Later editions were organized uh, by the Asociación Cultural Video Brazil, together with the SESCI. In the 1990s, the festival declared the expansion of its sphere of action to the entire geopolitical South and founded the association to host an increasingly broad heritage of documentation, publications, and video-based art collections. Today, there are no similar associations within Brazil or in the Southern Cone developing this task. Also in the late 80s, the Buenos Aires Video Festival was organized at the Spanish Cultural Center of Instituto de Cooperación Americana. The first editions were held under the exhibition format proposing a local videographic panorama. Since 1994, the festival became competitive and included selections from other countries, which stimulate the circulation of Argentine production in the region. Um, uh, the advent of a digital network and globalized culture modified the ways of using and accessing information. Thus began a gradual process of institutional computerization in which computer tools became a lease in the documentar documentary management of archives and collection, displacing analog systems, and in the case of video libraries, 
equipped with analog technologies and devices, this transformation led their deactivation as reference spaces and their consultation materials become archaeological objects. Although many institutions have preserved these collections, very few have undertaken a process of de digitization. On the other hand, the digital term had an impact on the ways of looking at and thinking about the phenomenon of regional video art. There was a shift from the narratives of the national scenes delineated by events during the 80s and 90s to the construction of narratives from the local scenes connected and immersed in the global map of the network. Some institutions began to post large amount of content and to communicate activities on their institutional websites. Simultaneously, new research projects began to explore the dispersed path of the art technology relationships, relationship in the Southern Corn. Under a format of, of uh, associative work between institution and academia. Due to uh, this interest, a significant number of platforms dedicated to regional video art began to emerge in the mid 2000s. Such projects have made online archives, which propose new reads on Latin American video art. As Walter and Gressin had pointed out, the research of intermediation, sorry, um, the research for intermediation runs through the entire history of media development in the West. Immersed in this logic, the new media have expanded in this capacity for mediation thanks to their power to incorporate almost all their previous supports and technologies. To look to this, the authors have proposed to understand the notion of remediation as reform and as a repair of other media. Thus, remediation can be understood both as a form of mediation of a prior media and as a repair, a way of preventing danger, um, such as the fading away of works born under formats that have become obsolete. Uh, in the case of analogical archives, this remediation has been articulated from valuable research projects that rescue from obsolescence a part of those audiovisual archives linked to the path of festivals proposed above. I will offer some examples. One of the first one of the first to appear was Umatic, a Chilean audiovisual heritage project. This initiative explored works made under this format in Chile between the year 1975 and 2000, including production, including productions presented at the Franco Chilenos and Encuentros Latinoamericanos, among others. The result of this research were articulated in three axes. The Umatic exhibition at the Museo de Contemporáneo in Chile in 2005 the publication of the book Apuntes para una Historia del Video en Chile, and the creation of the website Now We Found, which exhibited digitized fragments of more than 20 selected audiovisual pieces and more than 400 technical files and reviews of video works. In 2008, it began the rescue of SEMA's Umatic Archive Project in Uruguay. As mentioned before, the Central Media Audiovisuales was a company that developed a significant video production since the 1980s and played a very active role in the organization of the Encuentros Latinoamericanos de Video. Um, the team coordinator, coordinated by Mariela Balas, supported, the um, supported by the Universidad de la República, undertook the digitization of the company's archive in order to save it from the deterioration. Subsequently, they edited the book SEMA, as you can see on the screen. Uh, which covered both the work carried out by the, this audiovisual collective and the trajectory of the research project. For its part, the Cultural Association responsible for the Video Brazil Festival has focused its efforts on maintaining a physical headquarters to protect its collection, made up of thousands of catalog audiovisual and documentary pieces. Among them, 1,500 are videographic works that have passed through the festival. Currently, its online institutional catalog provides access to files that offer a brief synopsis and image and details of their participation in the Brazil. Um, video, sorry. In close connection with the need to give visibility, visibility to works shown in the mentioned events, Arcade Argentino project was born. The initiative emerged also in 2008 uh, to uh, recover pieces of the history of Argentine video art. 
Coordinated Bad Marela Cantu, it had the support of the Universidad Nacional de La Plata. He, uh, in its website, revamped in 2000, uh, to 2021, embed videos and information from many other online platforms and sites. The collaborative uh, non-profit nature of ARCA and some of, of the previous projects uh, appeals to the interests of the authors themselves to circulate works which helps to complete the history of the video art in the region. In this way, it avoids some of the difficulties posed by copyright when it comes to making this content accessible. After this mapping of art festivals, archives, and remediation projects, I would like to point out some problems video art archives have to face. Problems which pose methodological challenges to researchers interested in studying the Latin American video art. The first is the geographical distance between the archives of the Southern Cone, which makes it difficult both to consult collections and to approach local and regional stories. Furthermore, while many of the institutions offer partial online cataloging records, others do not ever provide this information. Although presented as a better answer, the digital remediation of video-based art and their circulation on a few platter, online platforms does not solve this problem. The dispersion of the audiovisual content and the difficulty of finding a corpus of works get gathered in the same place also exists in a networked world. Nevertheless, most of the research projects that have online archives also facilitate cross-referencing with websites of related projects, an aspect that helps exploratory tasks. Uh, the second problems are the documentary gaps in archives. Historically, the criteria for the creation of video archives and video libraries have not been stable, nor have uniform standards been established for the registration and cataloging of the pieces incorporated. Audiovisual works usually come together with records of activities and various institutional documents related or not to these works. However, the biggest problems arise when institutions lack documentation or works of works edited or produced by the institution itself. Perhaps the only solution to the problems posed by the dispersion and gaps in the archives is to support local research projects. In regular and uh, regular contact with institution, uh, institutional collections, capable of constructing critical readings and deepening the investigation of these materials in different archives. Only the circulation of multiple projects that propose this type of approach will make possible the articulation of new regional panoramic research. The, the third problem is the status of work and copyright. As a recurrent policy, video art activities and festivals stipulated they are in their terms and conditions that the copy of the selected work should remain at the disposal of the organizing institution. By participating, the author automatically consent that his or her work could be used for non-commercial cultural purposes. Thereby, the collection of these materials grew gradually according to the success of the events organized. In this way, the pieces presented acted as works when screened at the festivals, but regained their copy status on their archive. However, after the digital shift, Many festivals ceased to be held and the video libraries closed their doors to the public. The physical support of video art pieces remained in a place of patrimonial lack of definition, sometimes aggravated by gaps in their documentation. This means that any type of audiovisual record for publication would incur in copyright problems. In this case, the solution implemented by projects such as ARCA have consisted of becoming an open collaborative platform. Its expansion strategy is based on achieving a voluntary assignment and referring hyperlinks to websites of authors and institutions with own the copyright of the original works or documentations. The last point is the inaccessibility and loss of works in unstable media. As long as archives and video libraries remain open, analog, analog video artworks remain alive and continue to be included in multiple proposals. With the digital transformation, very few archives and institutional video libraries have undertaken the task of digitization of their collection, digitizing their collections, and many works became inaccessible. 
This has been excused on the ground of copyright issues and the high cost of digitization for the institutions. On the other hand, we start uh, from the premise that both analog and digital supports are un unstable. And although their digital remediation would allow extending their endurance, it is necessary to accompany such actions with others that provide them with meaning and ensure different ways of persistence. To conclude, um, the work I want to what I wanted to, to show is that the work carried out by proposals such as the mentioned here constitute a multidisciplinary research projects that go beyond digital remediation. They open the possibility of generating new readings on collections that would otherwise disappear from the memory of regional art histories. As we have seen in this presentation, they favor the study and dissemination of video artworks through the conservation and remediation of historical pieces and the expansion and reformulating, reformulation of genealogies of video art in the standard form. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yes, it's important to work that you're doing. Um, we have to stay for one more second. <laughs> she disappeared in the mist. No, I mean, so maybe there's a question. <laughs> but maybe not. Is there a question? Okay, um, I just want to say that uh, the International Symposium on Electronic Art was consciously named electronic and not digital because uh, analog uh, video is uh, part of this whole story. And, uh, and, and video, other, other than film, gives you the uh, uh, possibility of real time interaction. And that makes it part of the world of electronic art. And we see the deterioration of these vid videotapes go very fast. I have an incredible amount of videotapes at home and recently I have uh, been able to digitize a part of it and it seems that all my and half of my pneumatic tapes have all gone. The VHS is much better but uh, it's disappearing and not everybody understands the importance of uh, I mean, the people that could subsidize it don't easily do that, do that. So thank you for that presentation. The next speaker is uh, now you can sit in your own seat. <laughs> and the next speaker is my friend uh, uh, Ricardo Golfara, who is from Argentina and uh, works in uh, Montreal, where I guess he is giving his presentation from. Hello, Ricardo. Hello. I, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Vim. I'm going to share the screen. Um, okay, if everything goes well, I hope you can see my screen, my full screen now. So I'm going to talk about um, a forgotten, almost lost and partially hidden piece of history. At least part of it, I'm going to talk about new media arts in Latin America. I'm going to focus specifically in, in some part of that history and some part of the media production. And I would like to start with some several images from the DG Arts UNESCO knowledge portal that was done starting almost 20 years ago. Um, many of you, I'm sure you, you know the DG Arts projects or have been participating of the DG Art project that was led um, by Teresa Wagner and other people from UNESCO. I'm going to show some of the images um, here you can see the DG Art International Editorial Committee, part of that. And um, here, well, the different aspects and different sections of the DG Arts uh, project. But even if, if you go uh, through the different pages that I was recovering some time ago, this part, for example, about the young digital creators or a practical seminar to create simple electroacoustic pieces in easy stages, all this information that was done through several years of the DG Arts project, like this page about training, and you have these seminars, tutorials, etc. And even this full section, uh, the music using technology section, that I, it was the, the second part of my involvement with the DG Arts project, 
many years ago. Uh, even with this part, what happened is that, as you can see in this slide, different from the previous one, this is the, the original or close to the original, and this is what's happening now. So it says you are viewing an archive web page collected at the request of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is that most of these works, like for example here, where you have, uh, in fact, what I was doing for this project, I, as far as I know, I was the first one or, uh, that was contracted by UNESCO to do a research on the Latin American history of electroacoustic music of the whole region. Before that, I was working, believe it or not, uh, even on what was happening in the media arts in Asia and Oceania, because they didn't know what was happening there. And I have some information. So I was trying to help a little bit, but finally I was focusing in the region, in the region I know better. So, but if you see here in the Latin America and the Caribbean region, where I was writing these pieces of information, it was a long, long uh, report that they finally put it on the web, it was about 75,000 words in English. And there was a second report of another 45,000 words, mainly facts, not like uh, comments, but mainly facts, dates, names, et cetera, et cetera. But again, if you see here, you're viewing an archive web page. So if you try to find this, it will take you a while to find the information uh, from the DGR UNESCO uh, project. Also, before we were seeing some uh, images in English, now you can see these images uh, in, I mean, this text in Spanish because there was an English version as well as a Spanish version of this information. But all this, once again, you're viewing an archive web page. So it's very difficult to find this information. As you saw before, the music and technology section, now you can see it in Spanish, Musica y Tecnología, the history of electronic music uh, in the world, uh, in the Latin America and Caribbean, in Asia and the Pacific um, uh, region of the world. And also, this is just part of the long, long, long text that were included in this uh, DGR project, in this section about the electroacoustic music in Latin America in, in, in Spanish, once again, or specific sections with different names, many, many names, hundreds of names from Brazil, from Mexico, and from many other countries. So this information, you can still find it, but it's very difficult to access to that. So one of my points here is just that, as you can see, you are viewing, again, an archive web page, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the points is that this was a major, major work, major research effort done by UNESCO and involving a lot of us, a lot of the people from the community in trying to bring information about the media arts, even if I'm focusing here on a specific part of media arts, electroacoustic and computer music mostly, or mixed music or music together with videos or, or sometimes in sound installations, but still, the point here, that my main point here is how all this major effort has been in big part lost. Because if you try to find the information, it's not easy at all because of this situation with the archive web pages. So I decided to take some screenshots and try to, to show a little bit what was the situation. So um, part of showing this has to do with the idea of how we can preserve I mean, in this case, we are trying to preserve the effort to preserve information or pieces about electroacoustic and computer music. So what can we do as a community to recover this kind of efforts and learn also from the past as we don't make the same mistakes because this is being lost and the effort and the amount of information and the, um, the, the knowledge enclosed on, on this uh, project was really big. So today, if you're trying to access, you will see it more or less this way if you can find it. So the images are lost, etc. So as you can see, this is disappearing slowly, disappearing 
from our access. So this project and my, my contribution that was called historical aspect of electroacoustic music in Latin America from the pioneering to the present days, as I said before, there was an English version and a Spanish version. Both were uh, complementing each other. One has 75,000 words, the other one was uh, 40,000 words. And this is the number of composers I was naming in those reports. So 191 from Argentina, 14 Bolivia, etc. This was done around 2003. That was 2003, 2004 was when I was doing this report for UNESCO and was published. Those numbers you can see with a plus sign at the right. It means that I'm not only talking about composers and what they were doing as, as an artistic output, but also people I was mentioning, people that were producing uh, technological innovation. So when, when, just let me go to the focus now of uh, about what kind of things I was talking in those reports. I was talking about how electroacoustic music and computer music was starting uh, in, in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Cuba, many other countries. By this was happening starting in the 50s or even in the 40s. So most of, more or less when things were happening, almost at the same time, certain things were happening in several countries in Europe. But usually we know the information of uh, these countries in Europe and it's very hard to find what was happening in Latin America. So those names here like Mauricio Cagel, Juan Blanco, Reginaldo Carvalho, Juan Amenabar, Jose Vicente Azuar, Cesar Francisena, Raúl Pavón, Hilda Dianda, Horacio Bajone, those are names, some names of the many pioneers, of the many, many pioneers in Latin America. Mauricio Cagel is well known in Europe. He lived, he spent most of his life in Europe, but he was born in Argentina, he was studying in Argentina, and then he finally moved to Europe with a scholarship from Germany because he couldn't do in, in Argentina what he was expecting to do. So as you can see here in this catalog, uh, done uh, during the 60s, like, uh, in, so you can see that Kagel was already producing electroacoustic studies and pieces between 1950 and 1953, 54 in Argentina, or works by other people in, in Argentina, also in several labs already in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Same in Brazil, where people were starting to do electroacoustic music in the 50s. Or in Chile, Jose Vicente Azuar, that was doing electronic works like Juana Merabar in late 50s. Jose Vicente Azuar was also producing some uh, mixed, a, a hybrid works during the late 60s, early 70s in Chile. So it says, Así habló el computador. That's the way that uh, the computer talk. So he was producing his own devices. He was an engineer. He was producing his own devices with an analog digital music, computer music system. So let me go to talk a little bit about, not only about history and memory, but also about the problems, the achievements, and why to preserve, to document, and to disseminate. Because at some point, personal archives became public with free access. So my way to help the community to have access to this information that was happening in Latin America was in part uh, producing some CDs in collaboration with Computer Music Journal. I was the curator of that Computer Music Journal CD like 23 years ago, more or less, or before that with Leonardo Music Journal in 1994 with the name that was published in Spanish, Musica Electroacoustica de Compositores Latinoamericanos. Now I see it like a breakthrough, you know, it's like publishing with a title of, in Spanish of a CD that was published by MIT Press. Uh, it was not an easy task or all this too. So then, because in the UNESCO project was only text. So the Daniel Langlois Foundation finally supported me to do the Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection to do preservation, documentation and dissemination of recordings. So there are like over 2000 audio files of 1723 electroacoustic and computer music composition by like more than 700 from Argentina, more than 150 from Brazil, even from countries like Guatemala, Mexico, 
uh, Paraguay, Peru, Puerto Rico, so many works starting from the mid 50s. With information by pioneers, like for example, José de Oliveira in Brazil, a real important pioneer, maybe better known in Europe and in the North America than in Brazil. Well known in Brazil, but should be much better known. She was performing work with Senakis, um, with uh, Luciano Berio, with Igor Stravinsky. Uh, I mean, really a pioneer in Brazil. And he was, she was creating pieces like multimedia works that were premiered in the planetarium in, in Rio uh, in the early 60s with mixing all kinds of media, not just music. So if we go to another country, Raul Pavon, Raul Pavon was an engineer, one of the pioneers to create electronic music and computer music in, in Mexico, especially electroacoustic music. This was the first electronic music lab in Mexico, started around 1970. And he was, together with Hector Quintanar, he was the person who was creating this lab. And he was in the early 60s, before MOOC and Bukla, he designed this analog electronic sound synthesizer. So this was really an important uh, starting point, but was, it is almost unknown. Its name is Omniphone, and as I said, was a pioneering um, project to produce an analog uh, sound synthesizer. Juan Blanco, a very important pioneer from the Cuba electroacoustic and computer music, also is included after many years. I, it took me more than 20 years to get uh, his pieces in the collection. And now we have his music, most of his music, his computer and electroacoustic music in the Latin, America, Latin American electroacoustic music collection of the Daniel Langlois Foundation. This is a special photo because at the right, you have uh, John Appleton, a very well-known pioneer of electroacoustic and computer music in the US that um, he recently died. And at the left, we have Juan Blanco in Cuba, in La Habana. This photo, this photo is a very historical, relevant photo with um, Juan Blanco in the middle with a cigar here. And if you recognize this person, that's the Che Guevara. So uh, that was the very early years of the revolution. So you have the Juan Blanco and the Che Guevara uh, in this uh, session. And here you have Juan Blanco and Juan Blanco with a meeting that was done in France with a lot of pioneers of electronic and computer music like Robert Moog, Max Matthews, Jean-Claude Risset, Pierre Schaeffer, John Chowning, and many others. A really relevant meeting done in France. And this, it took me about 30 years to get this graphic I decided to show today here. We usually talk about the sampler, you know, the sound digital machine that can digitize any sound and you can use. And this was the big revolution in the history of music. So the sampler, the sampling machine was a really breakthrough in the way we do music today. But usually when we talk about the historical precedents, we talk about the Mellotron and we talk about uh, what was happening first in the late 40s by Chamberlain in the US and then Mellotron in the UK. But we don't talk, and there is a movie that doesn't talk about the multi-organo. The multi-organ depicted here was done a patent in 1942 by Juan Blanco. And if you analyze this, this is exactly the precedent of the Mellotron done many years ago or several years, uh, several years after that Juan Blanco was producing this uh, this graphic in Cuba. And he had the idea of the Mellotron using not magnetic tapes, plastic magnetic tapes, but he was having this idea uh, using uh, ferromagnetic wires. So um, a different, because it was not available the uh, plastic magnetic uh, tape at the time. So this is a major, major um, invention done by um, Juan Blanco. Let me show you briefly a little bit about Cesar Bolaños, another pioneer from, from Peru, uh, but he was doing a lot of work in Argentina during the Instituto Ditela, that was a major institute 
to produce new media, not only music, but in all aspects of new media during the 60s and early 70s until a military uh, government in Argentina closed the center. So this is a piece for tape, and it's a quadraphonic tape and guitar, but also um, Cesar Bolaños together with Cesar, um, with Mauricio Milchberg, a uh, scientist, they were producing some very early works uh, using computers and uh, musical instruments. So they were using uh, the computers to calculate the piece. So there were very early attempts to produce sound with a computer it was too hard, was too difficult, almost impossible, not impossible, but very, very hard. So at that time, they were producing 1970, two pieces, Milchberg and Bolaños, they were producing a SEPCO 2 and a SEPCO 1, uh, calculated by computer, and they were presenting these pieces also in Buenos Aires. Much of this information is available at the Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection. And also, if you see this photo, this photo is the first is the first electronic music lab at the Ditela Institute in Buenos Aires. And those people there are not only Bolaños, but some of the people who became after the main composers in different countries around the world, in Puerto Rico, in Chile, and other countries. But from that, from that in my last minutes, I was to, to show a little bit about Fernando von Reichenbach, who took this lab, the lab I was showing at the Ditela Institute, and transformed it into this one, an amazing major lab in the Ditela Institute in the 60s. So he transformed the old one that was there for about three, four years and turned it into this one that was amazing. He even invented this instrument that was able to transform graphics, drawings with pencil, with a machine that was transforming this into voltage control and then into sound. So that was called the, I'm not going to play it now, I'm only going to show it this way, and in the next summit, I will show it in full. So he transformed all these graphics that was drawn in pencil into this kind of graphics, complex graphics, and then finally, they were creating pieces like this that you can hear in the Latin American Electrophysics Music Collection, like Analogias Paraboloides by Pedro Karievsky. So they were producing this kind of works in this new lab with this um, analog graphic converted done by Fernando von Reichenbach in Buenos Aires. So finally, finally, let me finish with one of my own works that was the, as far as I know, uh, was premiered in the EC, exactly the place where the, the uh, where uh, Crescentino was showing just a few minutes before, she was talking about Buenos Aires video and what was happening in the EC, the Institute of Cooperation from Spain. And in that same place, I, I was performing live interacciones. That was the first interactive work created and performed in Argentina with digital sounds and images generated in real time. So let me play just a little, little bit of this. Okay, and just to finish, probably, you know, this is the same guy as talking now, but just about 32 years ago. Okay, so thank you so much. I think that, that I was showing a little bit of a partially forgotten, almost lost, and partially hidden also, and this is a long story we can talk in maybe today or some other time, so thank you everyone who was organizing this uh, summit and also to the organizers of ICF 2022.
Thanks. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, yeah, he gave it away at the end, but uh, what I wanted to say was, you think you listen to an histori historian, uh, but he's a, a, an artist too. He uh, combines that. He's, a, has a, he's an active artist. Um, does anybody feel like asking a question? Yeah, sorry, no, but it was distracting me as usual. <laughs> Just just talk very close to the microphone because I cannot hear it well. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting um, to me. Um, I I was wondering why uh, UNESCO. I I know partially the answer, but I would like you to tell us why UNESCO. Uh, especially focus on electronic music. Um, the second part of my question has to do with uh, your work in, at UNTREF. I knew that you were working, making a research of all the institutions working on electronic arts. And okay. I wanted to know if you uh, go further with this um, research and um, all this material, which is um, very, very interesting. If there is some publication where you can find what, what is uh, what is possible to find all this information together, I, I think it deserves like a good book, at least a reader. Thank you very much. Okay, I think it is uh, Crescenti who who was speaking. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. The UNESCO. Well. I was invited to the first meeting in the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. I was invited to the first meeting that UNESCO was trying to put a project together. And they finally started with the project uh, of the DG Arts. When the project started, they were not thinking, when the UNESCO project started, they were not thinking about focusing on electronic um, music, computer arts, et cetera, et cetera. They were really focusing on some other aspects of the media art. So finally, because I was in that first meeting together with many, many, many colleagues, I was not representing really um, uh, an institution. Uh, but finally, they understood that electronic music, electroacoustic music, computer music is part of the media art history. In fact, it's one of the first facts of the uh, history of electronic arts. We started with music, music technology, electroacoustic music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So finally, they decided to do this project. And they were focusing in many other aspects, not only in electroacoustic music. So I was focusing in my presentation about part of that. So I started with an overall approach of the DGR project of UNESCO. And then I started to focus more in my presentation on electronic music and computer music. But they focus in many other aspects. But all that information is being lost as I was showing, because there is no maintenance of the website. So that's the reason it's, it's almost fully archived. And so I can give you more details. Even that project, I could say that was at least partially inspired by something I was showing a few years before in the UNESCO headquarters during the ICEA in Paris, where I was showing a project we were doing in the National Ministry of Education in Argentina that was called READY or recursos didácticos, in English, didactic resources. That was very close to the idea that finally became Digi Arts Knowledge Portal some years after. That's part of the question. Thank you for talking about the EC and the Buenos Aires video X or 10, uh, because I was premiering my piece there, as Vim was kind enough to say, yes, I'm an active artist, not only archiving material and preserving material by other artists, um, the second part of your question, if I remember well, about UNTREF and where we can find more information. Yes, I am. I'm teaching at Concordia University in, in Montreal, and I'm also directing the, the Center for Electronic Art Research and Experimentation in Argentina, a little bit far away, one place from, it, from each other, so it's a little bit complex to manage. But we do research and we try to disseminate a lot of information there. So you can access 
e tu www.seyarteuntref.edu.ar Sorry, it's difficult to, to, to catch. I can put it on the chat, maybe, uh, when I'm finished. Okay, yes, just to, to close, you can access, um, you can access to the, uh, in the UCAM, you can look for my last name and for my PhD thesis. And in my doctoral thesis, you will find 500 pages about the history of Latin American electroacoustic music with a lot of links to. Thank you so much for the question and for the time. Thank you, Vim. Thank you, Ricardo. Thanks. We are running behind a bit, and um, <clears throat> uh, this will mean you have no more breaks. Um, uh, next speaker is from San Diego, where it's nine hours earlier. It's Amy Alexander, and she will talk about a subject that we touched before, the uh, preservation of performance art, if I'm not mistaken. Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Alexander. Uh, thanks very much for uh, having me here. Let me get my screen shared for you. Um, there we go. Uh, so I am a, a computational artist and a professor at UC San Diego. And my talk is called Always Only Once, The Paradox of Preserving Performative Digital Works. So uh, a familiar problem arises in digital media art preservation. Uh, there's the presumption that artworks are tangible or at least static, and that is at odds with the realities of computational media practices. So this contradiction was evident um, by the mid to late 1990s when net art first began to take hold. Early web art, as it was then usually known, was still commonly perceived as the placing of art objects like paintings or photos um, on the internet. But net artists like Olia Lialina uh, were already working beyond such assumptions. Uh, Olia's 1996 project, My Boyfriend Came Back From The War, was interactive and dynamic. So it implicitly proposed a cinematic language that was specific to net art by using browser frames and space as narrative elements. The art object of My Boyfriend Came Back To The War uh, was really the HTML code, which was written in dialogue with the rendering possibilities of 1996 web browsers. As a dynamic code-based work, the piece presents different issues for preservation than a static work. And uh, perhaps for that reason, uh, Olia Lalina has gone on to become a prominent figure in pushing the thinking about preserving net-based works. Yet my boyfriend came back from the war in some ways still functions as an object. The code is self-contained. It doesn't access external data. It doesn't run generative processes. So the archival issues are more about the display than about the processes taking place in the background. But by the mid nineties, uh, process-based net art was also being created. Um, for example, my first net art piece, the Multicultural Recycler was a generative work based on my semi-ironic prediction of a near future webcam celebrity phenomenon. This was um, over 10 years before YouTube uh, launched. Uh, so the Recycler ran server-side software uh, that ran custom image processing routines on live webcam images to perform, quote, cultural recycling and thus generate kitschy collaged images. So the Recycler was always performing, always changing, and this made preservation a challenge. I have documentation of the project in the form of screenshots and a screen capture video from various points in uh, the late 90s but they're all snapshots of specific moments in time. There was no adequate way of archiving something that ran and changed continuously over nearly 20 years. So the, this piece is no longer running. All, ironically, although we usually focus on software obsolescence when we talk about digital preservation, it was the physical vulnerability of objects that did the recycler in. Uh, it finally stopped running live in 2015 uh, when both the main server and backup servers were destroyed in a plumbing flood. 
Um, so just like any other artwork, digital artworks are vulnerable to their own physical fragility. So did you know that about 700 million... So algorithms are processes which once launched by their human uh, creators can continue to perform over time. Um, uh, and they can continue indefinitely. Uh, in my live stream project, What the Robot Saw, uh, this is a recent project, uh, contrarian algorithms continually curate newly uploaded videos from YouTube that have very few subscribers or views. Uh, these are videos by ordinarily people that YouTube's recommendation algorithms often render invisible. So my contrarian algorithms then edit, sequence, and mix the curated videos into a collaged live stream film. And they title the videos of people using Amazon Recognition's marketing-centric facial analysis algorithms. Um, the resulting algorithms and the resulting stream run endlessly, and it's always in the moment. So it's a perpetual performance. The algorithms are the performers. So you can document segments, but as with the recycler, they're just snapshots in time. So archives will always be representations of an ever receding past. Now, since we're talking about performative algorithms, let's look at some non-computer algorithmic performance histories. Happenings launched by uh, Alan Capro and other artists in the 1950s and 60s were performance art interventions, usually in public space. Uh, these were generally scripted with participants following sets of instructions, which we can think of as algorithms. But the importance of happenings was in the unscripted social outcomes that took place. And by the early 1970s, the term happening was used, at least in the US, as a general term to refer to the energy of free flowing social interactions. Now let's fast forward uh, to some contemporary algorithmic performic performance practices. Here's Regatron live coding at an algorithm. Uh, an algorithm is a live coding event uh, inspired by raves. At an algorithm, attendees dance and party to the sound and image of algorithmic music being coded live. So this photo depicts performers, the performance, and the crowd. And importantly, it depicts the process, live coding. We can't experience the algorithms directly because they're the artist's creative process, but we experience their representation in what we see on screen and what we hear. At the performance, we experience this representation in real time and documentation, it's past tense. But the crowd was important in that photo too. It suggests everything the image can't communicate. What about the event, the rave, the social interaction, the happening? So you can take crowd video that tries to capture the energy, but the happening can only be represented in the form of images and sound. Now, let's look at another example from the past. Uh, liquid light shows were a type of visual performance popular in the late 1960s. Uh, light show ensembles projected uh, combinations of films, slides, uh, colored gels, colored oils onto the screen at uh, concerts and other events. The Los Angeles Light Show Ensemble Single Wing Turquoise Bird uh, were known for their highly collaborative improvisational uh, projections. And film historian Bill Moritz attended one of the group's performances in 1969, and he reviewed it for LA's Weekly Planet magazine. And he wrote in this sort of a Gertrude Stein-like uh, syntax about it. Uh, so he wrote, these words are not telling at all because it is a 1960s thing and most English words are a 14th or 16th century thing. And if single wing turquoise bird could be writing it, they would be writing it, but they are showing it and always only once because Friday, January 17th, 1969 was not like Saturday, January 18th, 1969. So Moritz is always only once might be a useful approach to thinking about archiving contemporary media performance as well. The happening can be represented and documented, but it can't really be archived or preserved. And on top of that, it can be difficult for artists without expensive gear um, to capture good sound and image in a live audiovisual performance setting. 
So it may be tempting to give up. Uh, but the problem is historicization depends on documentation. Single-winged turquoise bird was a real light show, but these images I'm showing you are from a Hollywood fictional film. How that happened was in the late 60s, uh, James Bridges, who was a Hollywood writer director, uh, attended some of single-winged turquoise bird's performances. Uh, he had learned about the ensemble from a mutual friend, uh, the painter Sam Francis. When Bridges made the 1970 feature, uh, The Baby Maker, uh, he decided to include a scene that takes place at a light show and had single wing turquoise bird in the film as the light show ensemble. So creating film documentation was impossible for single wing turquoise bird themselves. Uh, pointing an available 1960s movie camera at a projection screen would not have produced a satisfactory result. Um, but for the film The Baby Maker, the movie production company worked with the light show members to film and composite their performance in layers, and that produced a high quality clip. Since the ensemble uh, appears in the film performing their visuals, the scene in which they appear uh, also serves as documentation of the performance itself albeit fictionalized. Now, single-winged turquoise bird are, there they are now on screen. Um, single-winged turquoise bird are one of the few 60s light shows for which there's reasonably good documentation. This has likely helped them to become better historicized over the years uh, than some of their peers. But the existence of their documentation is due in part to luck. Um, although they were a prominent light show, they were also in the right place Los Angeles at the right time and with the right connections to appear in a film. Uh, yet the film is just documentation at best. Uh, as Bill Moritz's text points out, uh, the light shows were always only once and could never be preserved. Anything performative never can be. 60s light shows were an example of expanded cinema, which uh, was a term coined in the 1960s by Van Stan van der Meek and popularized by Gene Youngblood's 1970 book of the same name. Youngblood's book proposed that cinema had expanded beyond film to incorporate television, video art, computer art, and light shows, and so on. And he also discussed single wing turquoise bird uh, in the expanded cinema book. Some of the contemporary practices we've been discussing today, like uh, live coding, audiovisual performance, and algorithmically generated cinema uh, can be considered expanded cinema performative practices. And despite the term 60s origins, broad views of expanded cinema can also encompass earlier forms of non-narrative moving image. So let's look at some even earlier cases of expanded cinema performance documentation practices. Um, visual performance histories often start with the color organ. The classic color organ is a visual instrument performed with a keyboard that produces light rather than sound. Um, so color organs actually date back to at least the 1700s uh, when uh, Father Castell's ocular harpsichord generated light using candles. But color organ development really became more active in the early 1900s because electricity became widespread widespread, sorry. Uh, one, uh, one early uh, 20th century color organ inventor was Mary Halleck Greenwald. Uh, Greenwald had emigrated to the US uh, from Syria as a child and she spent most of her life in Philadelphia. She trained as a classical pianist and then she decided to devote her career to the development of performing colored light. Her contemporary and rival color organ developer, Thomas Wilfred, uh, had emigrated from Denmark and he spent most of his career uh, not far from Greenwald in New York. There's about two hours between New York and Philadelphia. Um, and although both Greenwald and Wilfred presented and performed publicly, Wilfred has been cited within visual performance histories far more consistently than Greenwald has. Um, and while Greenwald's work has received more attention in the past few years, until recently, it was hard to find much written about her work at all. 
Uh, Wilfred did receive uh, attention from the contemporary art world during his lifetime, which Greenwald did not. Um, as a result, uh, Wilfred had received more substantive press attention than Greenwald. Uh, Greenwald was treated as something as a novelty performer by the press. So it's easy to see why Wilfred's work uh, would be treated differently by historians as well. Yet it's hard to discern how much of their difference in access to venues and critical attention during their lives derived from their work itself versus other attributes like gender and their access to social networks. There's another factor that facilitates discussion of Wilfred's work by historians. Like single wing turquoise bird, uh, Wilfred's work benefits from fortuitous documentation beyond what was ordinarily available to artists at the time. Wilfred uh, had been developing these Clavilux uh, color organ systems, and he eventually decided to develop a home version that he could sell to consumers. So instead of requiring a performer, this version could play automatically. And he called this one the Clavilux Jr. The Clavilux Jr. operated through the use of these awesome looking hand painted glass records. Um, light was projected through the records, bounced off various surfaces within the machine, and eventually it was projected onto uh, a screen on, front, on the front of the machine. There are several Clavilex Jr. still extant. So unlike my recycler servers, these were geographically uh, distributed. Um, and uh, the, so these existing Clavilex Juniors can still play their glass records. Um, so these units uh, can be exhibited as video sculptures in contemporary exhibitions. And there are also some larger Clavilux, the Clavilexes that Wilfred uh, built for museums that have been restored. So the screens of all these units can now be recorded with modern video equipment. Uh, so Wilfred's original 1930s time-based light works are now documented in contemporary high definition video. Operating the Clavilux Junior Machine 90 years later actually recreates the algorithmic performance rather than merely representing it. The marks painted on the glass discs function as executable software code that generates the time-based visuals. The software, so to speak, can still be run. So we find ourselves able to view contemporary high definition video documentation of generative work from the 1930s. And doing so feels kind of like time travel. There's comparatively little visual documentation of Greenwald's color performance work, uh, but there's a great deal of documentation of her process. She gave lectures and performances, which were reviewed in newspapers, but she also did an extensive amount of self-archiving. During her career, she continually seemed to feel she was not receiving the credit she deserved for her inventions. Uh, presumably for this reason, uh, she saved and often annotated a vast, a really vast quantity of materials uh, documenting and discussing her work. And in 1936, she began donating these materials to um, uh, the historical uh, materials from her archive to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. She continued making these donations until 1949, a year before her death. So the Historical Society uh, now has these in a collection called the Mary Halleck Greenwald Papers Collection, and it contains thousands of pieces of paper that historicize Greenwald's practice and research, newspaper, press clippings, technical diagrams, lecture notes, jotted ideas on note paper, uh, letters to vendors, notes from the many times she challenged what she felt were infringements on her intellectual property. <laughs> there is, there's something vast uh, in the vastness of Greenwald's archive, the obsessive performance of self-archiving that archives her work in a way no machine nor film of a performance could do. It's fortunate that her papers are archived at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, uh, otherwise they uh, probably would have been destroyed. But although visitors in Philadelphia can view the materials, uh, they're invisible to most of the world. So over the past several years, I've been trying to make them more visible. I periodically 
uh, travel to Philadelphia and photograph as many items in the archive as possible. I then keyword tag and post the images in a public online archive I call the Mary Halleck Greenwald Visibility Project. The Visibility Project is in some ways, it's self-performative. The posting of the multitude of images mirrors Greenwald's performative, almost compulsive compilation of the vast archive uh, that documents her process in a way she knew nobody else would. My database is very crude, it's incomplete, it's limited by time and resources, but the act of producing an online archive of scrap clippings compiled by an artist who died in 1950 always feels to me like another act of time travel. So what might, le what might we learn from these past expanded cinema practices that can be useful in thinking about archiving uh, process-based computational work? Always only once. We can consider the failures of adequately preserving processes, performance, and happenings a success. But we shouldn't let the always only once paradox of preservation stop us from documenting and historicizing. Uh, we can think about how alternate forms of documentation and archiving can function to represent practices for which the process and content context is more important than the display. We can remember that alternate, alternate pro approaches can be especially important in increasing visibility of artists and practices that uh, might otherwise be overlooked. Um, considering how visibility impacts history, we can think about how we can make hidden histories more publicly visible. Are underrepresented groups and region also under, underrepresented in access to traditional forms of documentation and archiving? And we can consider the artist's attempts to historicize their practice as a specific gesture. The performance of archiving may communicate something as significant as the archive that's created. And of course, we can always look for opportunities for time travel. So thank you very much. That was a very good presentation, Amy. Thank you. And I loved the, the subject. Um, of course, I'm an old guy, so I, I was there at these happenings and at the liquid light shows, and I uh, find it uh, exciting the way you're uh, working on preserving those things or rely, uh, making them happen again in a way. So that uh, because you know, when I see archives mainly text, and this is much better. Um, they are behind in schedule. So just one question, if anyone wants, nobody dares. So they are behind schedule. I'm sorry, the next people are already waiting to go. But these people here in uh, Barcelona need a little break. So we are going to have a little pause of a few minutes, and then we'll continue to the last block of this summit. Thank you again, Amy. Thank you. So really just a few minutes. I can bring coffee because the machine is much too slow.